I would like to welcome you to the Ingham County Treatment Court's 8th Annual Breakfast Foundation meeting. And it has been a wonderful journey. I know that for many of you, you've heard these incredible transformational stories of people that have been through our specialty courts. What an amazing experience. I was just talking to Randy this morning and his journey is going to end in just a couple of days. Um, 19 months that he's gone through this program and we talked about how when he first heard about 19 months, he thought, oh my goodness, I don't know, that's such a long way. And now he's two days away from that. You know, we talked about taking a step every day. Yeah. And, you know, I, I said, are you proud of yourself? He said, I'm incredibly proud of myself. And I said, well, we, I said, everyone in this room is proud of you. And he said, Sherry, I could not have done it without the different groups that are in this room. He said, they, they put us like in a cocoon. We're in this safe cocoon and we make this journey and somehow we come out on the other side better and stronger. And it's interesting that he told me the house that he was in as part of his group therapy, he's actually going back to help. And I said, what a powerful statement to the people, 12 to 13 men who live there, to see you come through, the impact that you can have because you've walked the journey. And so, you know, we talk about life coming first full circle and, and really being our authentic self, whatever that is. And for him, um, what, a, what an incredible thing for him to know that he's made it through two more days and now he gets to go back. And part of why you're here today is to support the foundation that helps bring that together. And for the past 11 years, we have had an incredible leader. And I would, at this time, like to have John Nicolucci come on up. And Charlotte Clemens, could you please join me up here as well? Charlotte's Charlotte like doesn't like to come forward. I know she always in. Is Charlotte here? Here she comes. Charlotte Clemens, come on down. Give her a round of applause. Charla, thank you so much for everything that you do to help John and to make everything possible. And we know that this is part of your journey as well. And we have a surprise spa package for oh you. So can we give her a round of applause? And you, sir, you incredibly humble leader that you are, Thank you so much for your service, for your leadership, for your dedication to really investing your whole heart into this program. This gift is for you. John is leaving as the president of the foundation um, at the end of his term, 11 years. Um, could you just open that a little bit, please? Just take out, you know, you gotta see what's in the present. We always know. Early, okay? Christmas. It's a golf polo with the county foundation logo on it. Very nice. Yes. <laughs> so truly, at, at this time, I would like you all to really stand and give them the props that they need for over 11 years of all their service to this community. I just want to say thank you very much. Uh, quite frankly, um, this isn't about me. It certainly is about Charlotte because she runs the show along with Jerry. So thank you very much. We're honored and uh, we'll keep the show on the road. Thank you. Thank you, John. We definitely want to say thank you to you all for being here today and as well as to our sponsors. Please go ahead and enjoy your breakfast while we begin our opening comments. And these sponsors have committed their dollars to support our breakfast and our programs, and that means that all of the contributions that you make today will go directly to the foundation to help the participants in our four Ingham County treatment courts really achieve their goals. What we're going to be doing is we'd like to take some group pictures. So when I call you up, we would like to give you a plaque, 
and uh, take your picture. And we're going to do this in groups. So I would like to call forward first, and we can hold our applause until I make it through the group. For the bronze level, Honorable Louise Alderson, Bailey and Tara Nova, Scott Rigglesworth, Ingham County Sheriff's Office, the Honorable Janelle Lawless, Nicole Matusko, Women Lawyers Association of Michigan, and ICBA Young Lawyers Section. So could you all please come forward and thank you so much. Okay, in our next group, the Silver Group, the Honorable Donald Allen Jr., Adam, Cognitive Consultants, Dean Transportation, Foster Swift, Collins and Smith PC, Maynard Kasterison, Mid-Michigan Recovery Services Incorporated, John Nicolucci, Par Rehab Services, Pat, Reality Counseling, and State Farm. Please let's show our appreciation to our silver sponsors. And for our gold sponsors, our gold sponsors, Auto Owners, Ingham County Bar Foundation, Judicial Services Group, LathQ, the Honorable Andrea Larkin, Scram, Sinus Dramus, Richard Snyder, and Total Court Services. Please say thank you to our gold sponsors. And now we're going to have our Legacy Foundation. Our Legacy Foundation goes to the Joe Pentecost Foundation. The Joe Pentecost Foundation, thank you so much for your generosity. All right, I just want to share a few statistics with you as we begin our meal. You know, unlike most treatment programs, treatment courts are noted to have an 88% success rate. Nearly 80% of all people behind bars are addicted to drug and alcohol, and about 50% of neglect and abuse cases involve substance abuse. The annual cost associated with alcohol-related incidents right now is in the billions of dollars. And today you're going to learn more about how these courts function and how you can help. So right now I'd like to introduce to you the president of the Ingham County Treatment Course Foundation, Mr. John Nicolucci from Foster Swift, Collins, and Smith. All right. Hold on just a second. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're honored. Um, let me just introduce, and I know people are going to be standing up and sitting down and trying to eat, so please bear with us. We just wanted to introduce our uh, board of directors so that everyone uh, who is not on the board can at least know who is serving the treatment courts here in Ingham County. And what? We'll ask that our board of directors please stand. So we will start with the Honorable Louise Alderson. The Honorable Donald Allen. The, uh, hold your applause. No, you can clap. They're judges. You can clap. The Honorable Laura Baird. Jesse Bessonen. Sherry Blankenship. Under Sheriff Andrew Bauck, who is becoming our new president. So there you go. Good luck to him. Ro Robert Davis, Mona Davis, Betsy Davis Pennington, Jacqueline Dupler, Robert Easterly, Mary Ferrante, Michael Green, Kimberly Halfley, John Hayes, Amy Eisler, Haley Crombeen, the Honorable Andrea Larkin, Ryan Larson, the Honorable Janelle Lawless, Scott Leroy, Nicole Matusko, Brenda Rail, Christine Sayers, we got a big group. 
Richard Snyder, Danielle Strauss, Linda Vale, Dr. Brooke Van Buren Hay, Denise Wells, and last but not least, Tom Woods. Okay, there is your board of directors. Uh, we do not want to forget our executive director. You might have seen her running around here. That is Jerry Corey. So thank you, Jerry, for all you do. Thank you. And of course, Charlotte Clements, who was up here earlier, um, she and Jerry truly make all of this happen in addition to the board of directors. So thank you, Charlotte. Okay, now is our opportunity to, quite frankly, all of you are special. We're honored that you're here. We do want to just make note of some of those uh, who are present as well. Uh, and we might have uh, covered some of these before, but we want to say hello and thank you to the following. The Honorable Laura Baird, the Honorable Andrea Larkin, and you don't have to stand unless you want to. <laughs> the Honorable Louise Alderson, uh, the retired Honorable Frank DeLuca, our Eaton County Sheriff Reich, Ingham County Sheriff, Under Sheriff Andy Bout, Ingham County Sheriff Scott Rigglesworth, West Huddleston, who uh, has been with us before and ha was our keynote speaker, uh, the Honorable Kristen Simmons, the Honorable Cynthia Ward, uh, the Honorable Judge Hoffman, who I believe is retired as well, the Honorable Janelle Lawless, the Honorable Stacia Buchanan, the Honorable Clinton Kennedy, the Honorable Wanda Stokes, and the Honorable Shauna Dunnings. And if I've missed anybody, please accept our apologies, but thank you for being here. Okay, let me just tell you very briefly about our treatment courts here in Ingham County. Uh, we have the 55th District Court located in Mason, and that is presided over by the Honorable Donald Allen. Thank you, Judge Allen. Next is the 54A District Court, um, and that is uh, located in Lansing, Michigan, presided over by the Honorable Louise Alderson. Thank you, Judge Alderson. We have the 30th Circuit uh, Family Dependency Treatment Court. That's here in uh, Ingham County, Lansing as well. And we thank the presiding judge, the Honorable Janelle Lawless. Over in East Lansing, we have the 54B District Court, and um, I think there's a number of courts that the, uh, the Honorable Andrea Larkin is overseeing. There's a Veterans Treatment Court there, there's a Sobriety Court there, and there's a Drug Court there, at, at least according to the website. Is that right, Judge? Sure. All right, Ball, there you go. Judge Ball presides over the Veterans Court. Okay, all right. Thank you, Judge Ball, wherever you are. <laughs> uh, and then finally, we have the Family Recovery Court, which uh, I think is also referred to as the Phoenix Court. It's our newest member. Uh, and the presiding judge there is the Honorable Laura Baird. So thank you, Judge Baird. Um, according to the numbers I have been provided, we're almost at 1,000. Uh, our graduates from these programs are now over 950 just here in Ingham County. It's due to the hard work. Yes, thank you. This, of course, doesn't happen without the hard work from our treatment courts staffs. Many of these uh, Probation officers are uh, obviously sitting on our board of directors, so we are honored by their presence and all the hard work that they do. Uh, our foundation provides support uh, to the uh, courts and directly to the probation officers. Typically what happens is, uh, in today's world, we see emails from our probation officers saying, please help us, we need funds because this person needs, uh, cannot afford to pay for testing, cannot afford to pay for transportation services, might have a medical issue, whatever it is, the requests come to the board. Uh, we send those out to the board for review and approval. And in almost all cases, I think I've only recall one in 11 years, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, in almost all cases, we uh, review and approve those as soon as we can. So uh, we thank the uh, probation officers for coming to us. We're honored that we're able to provide those funds and uh, assist those who are rebuilding their lives. Uh, in that regard, you will find at your table a uh, 
commitment form. We ask that you take a look at that and please consider donating to the, there you go, wave it, yes, nice. Uh, consider donating to the uh, foundation if at all possible. If you've already done that, thank you very much. Uh, obviously, all of us in this room are aware of uh, one or more persons who've dealt with sobriety issues, uh, whether it's alcohol, drugs, or some other issue that uh, affects families, community, businesses, whatever it is. At this time, it's my honor to introduce our keynote speaker. And this is Staff Sergeant Tommy Riemann. Um, 14 years of service in the Army. Uh, during that time, he was a recipient of the Silver Star, which is one of the nation's highest awards for uh, uh, valor in combat. In addition, he was awarded the Purple Heart for his service in uh, Iraq. Uh, of course, the Purple Heart is awarded for those who are wounded while serving with the U.S. military. Uh, you may recall this if your memory is good. President George W. Bush actually honored Staff Sergeant Tommy Riemann during the State of the Union address back in uh, 2007. Um, unfortunately, as happens with many of the people that our courts deal with, um, Staff Sergeant Riemann um, and he'll tell his story, but he hit rock bottom. Uh, thanks to the help of a number of people, he was uh, involved in a veterans treatment court. I don't want to tell his whole story, so I'll leave that to him. However, um, thanks to his hard work, thanks to the hard work of those working with him in that treatment court, and quite frankly, probably thanks to uh, God to keep, for keeping this man alive, he's here to tell his story today. So, um, he came to us all the way from North Carolina. I'll let him tell his story. We thank him for his service to this country. And without further ado, here is Staff Sergeant Tommy Reed. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thanks, Sherry, John, West. I uh, did come from North Carolina. It's a hell of a lot warmer there. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Lansing, for that nice morning cold wake up. It's awesome to be here. Uh, I don't want to sound cliche. You come in, you hear a keynote, and it is awesome to be here. But what I see are a lot of servants. And being around uh, this work, seeing people show up every day, putting different types of uniforms on, different hats from all walks of life uh, with a purpose. And that purpose is to serve other people. Uh, it's a diff different atmosphere. It just feels different in here. And I, I want to recognize that and just make sure you're, I remind you how awesome you guys are. Uh, my journey began, I grew up in Independence, Kentucky. It was a very small town. Uh, my mom and dad and my sister, Jennifer, we were 15 months apart. I was the captain of the football team, wrestling team. Had a, a pretty good uh, childhood. I had some trauma there, but you know, what kid didn't growing up in the 80s, 90s? Your dad whipped your butt, right? <laughs> but, uh, Independence had a cap for me, and I had a much larger cap. You know, I was trending this way and wanted to go do something with my life. And the only way I knew to do that was the United States Army. I wanted to put a uniform on and serve my country and do my honor and do my best, and I knew something that was bigger out there for me. So I did. It was the greatest experience I've ever had. I still say that today. I had my struggles, but the U.S. Army taught me more about myself than I could ever have found out in any other situation. So I joined in 1999, became an infantryman, airborne paratrooper, went into the 82nd Airborne Division in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Whole different new experience for me. I knew what a team was, played football, uh, but when you exchange football for a weapon and you have the responsibility to protect or to take a life, uh, that puts the playing field in a much different capacity. I liked it enough, I re-enlisted, went to Germany, I went to Kosovo for a couple years, just really enjoyed myself and it staged us up until uh, 2001. You know, 9-11 happened, the tempo changed. You know, in 1999, 2000, we were gearing up for something, not really sure, but still had this Cold War mindset. When 9-11 happened, things changed, training changed, we had to prepare for an entire different enemy. So I joined a small team called LURS, Long Range Reconnaissance and Surveillance. 
Uh, basically, a six-man team that goes deep behind enemy lines, identifies targets undetected, and uh, silences the targets with airstrikes or whatever means necessary. So in 2003, we got the call to invade Iraq. Three days before the war would start, our team would insert uh, near Anajaf, which is just south of Baghdad. Six men, you got to be kind of close to go sit in a hide site or a hole. We dig a hole for seven days, and you're there. You know everything about your buddy. The amount of training, the amount of time, the amount of fellowship, the amount of family that you create, that bond, is like no other. You hear people talk about it, but it is real. So imagine being 20 years old, 20, well, I can't do my math, 22 years old, and getting ready to go into a foreign country, getting ready to potentially never come back. I was married at the time, young and dumb, and you finished the sentence. <laughs> but that saved my life. That arrogance, that confidence, that ability to feel invincible, that's what kept us alive. That ability to switch a, or flip a switch and to be able to take someone's life and forget about it and move on to the next and do it again and do it again and do it again. That removes compassion. It removes empathy for life. It, it puts a weird value on the human being. It takes, it just devalues. It almost becomes a transaction. That's what kept me alive. It was a beautiful thing then, but turning that around, reversing that, is hell. So go back to 2003. We're in Iraq. We walked 12 miles through the middle of the night, 120 pounds on our back, there for seven days. As soon as we get in the hole, we start seeing enemy come down from the regime loyalists in Baghdad by the hundreds, by the droves, truckloads. So we get to work. We start calling in airstrikes. And Airstrike after airstrike after airstrike for three solid days, just wiping out enemy, wiping them out, extinguishing them, removing them, whatever term you want to use. And it was awesome because we felt confident that we were doing the right thing. We were there to fight a war. We were there to do what we were told. This was what we were bred to do. We were there to kill bad guys that were trying to harm our country. And it felt amazing. And then day in and day out, that initiated the war. They pulled us out and deemed us heroes at the battle, and we went right back to work for a year and a half. Every day, we were doing something. Step and repeat, step and repeat. When you're going around everywhere, ready to pull a trigger to remove somebody from this earth, it's pretty hostile, it's pretty intense, it's pretty violent. Only a few people can really do that. It takes a special crew, but it takes a lot of training and a lot of work. It leads us up until 2000, or, uh, December 3rd, 2003. We were just south of Baghdad. The missions had changed a little bit. We occupied Iraq very quickly, and our teams would go out and identify certain smaller threats and then take them out. Well, we were in the, uh, near the prison and uh, it kept being attacked. So we went out on a recon mission to identify, we had some intel that there was some high value targets coming together for a big meeting. So we were gonna go confirm that they were meeting, confirm that the right targets were there, and eliminate the enemy. Well, en route, we were in three vehicles, and if you remember in 2003, we were rolling around in hodgepodge stuff. We had you know, things from Still, the Gulf War, uh, we didn't have the high technology vehicles that we have and the armor and, uh, you know, the evolved training that you have today. So we're rolling around, no doors on the trucks, sandbags, whatever, you know, Billy Bob and the, the shop could put on, he'd put more metal, we'd create more shrapnel. You know, we just weren't really sure what we were doing at some points. But we're en route, three Humvees, eight of us, no doors. And uh, we get hit. 
We were ambushed by 35 enemy insurgents. We got hit with three RPGs, or rocket-propelled grenades, three IEDs, improvised explosive devices. RPG skips off in front of my vehicle, behind my vehicle, and hits the third vehicle. Our truck gets sprayed full of ammunition. And at that time, to win a firefight, you, the biggest gun has to be in the fight. So I used my body as a shield to protect my gunner, and I was shot in the arm, the chest, and took 11 pieces of shrapnel to my body. A bullet went off my helmet and my gunner's buttocks, and my buddy Bruce lost his right leg and took 183 pieces of shrapnel to his body, just completely shredded apart. We continued to engage the enemy, eventually silencing all 35 men, and we moved out of the kill zone. That's when I realized I'd been wounded. And my buddy um, Mac, my gunner, he was fine, but the, had the million dollar wound, as Forrest Gump would say. And my buddy Bruce was in the rear vehicle. He was laying in a pool of his own blood. We went to go put a tourniquet on Bruce, and we were ambushed again by 15 more guys. At that point, we were very angry. We took down the 15 men, uh, the medevac came, and we were extracted. And that's the last I saw of most of my guys. I went from the battlefield, from being the man on the ground, to laying in a hospital bed, transferred from Baghdad to Lawnstool to Walter Reed to Walmack at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and then three days later introduced back to my wife. She's 18, I'm 22 at the time. Does she speak combat? Because that's all I spoke. Just like that, I'm back in society. How do you process that? What do you do with that? How do you turn it off? You don't. It takes time. It takes a lot of work. It takes people that know what they're doing. It takes a, a community that understands. At that time, we didn't have that. We were still new to all this, so we thought, right? We'd been to war. We went to Vietnam. That was different. Would you agree? We're getting better, but man, it took a lot of heartache and pain to get to where we're at today. So I came back December 17th, I think, back to the... Um, yeah, back to Fort Bragg, December 17, 2003. I'm home for Christmas, and December 27th, I get a phone call that my sister had passed from kidney disease. So add another layer of trauma. My team, they come back to Germany. I'm at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. They reissue me another set of orders. My team and my unit comes back to Germany, still don't see them. And then you feel like you've let them down. They're still fighting a war. They're still over in the fight. Where do I want to be? I want to be with my brothers, no matter what the cost. You know, these guys were men I was willing to die for. And they're over there fighting without me. It's like at your job, somebody replacing you. It's a terrible feeling. So they got back. I get the word that uh, they would nominated me for a Silver Star and Purple Heart. Uh, the Purple Heart just means I'm a an idiot and didn't get out of the way. Uh, but the Silver Star meant a lot to me because those guys put me in for that. And if you're in the military having any honor, it doesn't matter what it is, but when you're nominated by your brother, and that is very special. So uh, it started this whirlwind. Um, the Army identified me as a hero. I didn't know what that meant, but uh, they treated me pretty well. I got to do some amazing things. They made an action figure out of me, a video game character. I toured the country telling that story, and I started to feel like a hero. But underneath, I never dealt with any of that trauma, that significant trauma that I experienced, nor did I know how to process it. You know, we, most of us grew up in a time where you just didn't talk about your feelings, especially if you knew my dad. Just didn't, you dealt with it. Suck it up, drive on, and that was also the Army mentality. So you just dealt with it. Well, not dealing with it is not dealing with it. And it will come out. And it did for me. So I started to recognize and notice problems. And how I dealt with them was drinking and taking pills. I didn't know how to feel. I didn't know to. I couldn't name it to tame it. I couldn't do any of that. 
And so life became unmanageable and out of control. I started to cheat on my wife. I had two kids. I wasn't really parenting. You know, I went from hero to zero like that because of the poor decisions I was making. And I couldn't get out of my own way. I wanted to stop. I knew I was doing these wrong things. But I felt like I was going crazy. I didn't know what else to do. Oh, this is normal. You're going to feel this way. You went to, no kidding. What do I do? What do I do with that? I'm going to do what I know. I'm going to drink. It was the only thing where I felt like I could be me again. That I could just get a little moment of peace inside. That I could quiet the mechanism. I could shut it up. And I would continue to do that. I continued to feel lost, so I wanted to redeploy. I figured this horrible logic that if I went back to Iraq, that's where I lost myself. So maybe if I went back, I'd find myself again. Oh, I'm at a different place. I'm a little better. Yeah, I got a drinking problem. I'll deal with that. If I'm over there, I can't drink. That's great. So I redeployed in 2010. Horrible decision. In 2010, completely different atmosphere. In 2010, we're sustaining our operations. It's not, we weren't taking the fight to the enemy. We were sitting around trying to figure out what the heck we're going to do strategically. So we would just get assaulted and take it because we had these big vehicles. Well, they were smart enough to come up with, you know, a $25 mechanism from Radio Shack to blow up our million dollar MRAP. And so I didn't feel at home. I didn't feel like I did in 2003. I didn't feel like I was fighting for the right thing. I thought we were there just sustaining a, a political obligation. So one night I came into my chew. I had laid out pictures of my kids, of my ex-wife, of my fiance at the time, and I just felt like I was a complete letdown. I had completely destroyed their lives, that I wasn't significant enough that if I could just take my life for right now, they would be better off. And it would be easier because I did it in country. Like they wouldn't have to deal with any of that. Oh, he died over there. Dad was going crazy. We get it. It's fine. So I put a rifle in my mouth, and I put the selector switch from safe to semi, semi to safe, repeatedly, over and over. And I was talking myself, trying to talk myself into pulling the trigger. And my roommate come walking in from the shower, pounding on the door. And that's what stopped me. It was that pause. And he was a, a captain of police force stateside. And he just gave me a hug in that moment. If it wasn't for Tony stepping in, who knows what would happen. But we all know the end of that story. So Tony saved my life, in a sense, coming in, interjecting, talking some sense into me, and then the follow-up, making sure that I received help afterwards. So for the first time, I went to see a mental health counselor in my life, in combat. A little different than going to see your therapist down the street. Um, and they put me on a little Ambien and gave me some medication, gave me three days off, and then right back at it. Pretty good treatment, right? We continued operations. The job still has to get done. And I was in charge, so we just went right back at it. Uh, oh, I saw a doctor. I'm fine. Everything's great. Look, I got the paperwork. I, you know, I checked in. I got some medication. We're good. This is sweet. I'm going back to the States. We get redeployed back to the States, and I got to start my life over. I'm there, I, I create my own business, become very successful. I'm a consultant for Hooters and Right Arm Entertainment, and Kangaroo Express, showing people how to give back to the military. It was quite effective, but I felt lost. I still didn't take care of any of those things. So I started to drink again. You know, it was great being in Iraq. I was sober for a while. Um, but when you have nothing but time and you stew on your trauma, it's going to create more trauma. So I have to figure out what I'm going to do. Well, I continue to drink again. And what do I do? I self-sabotage. I ruined a great thing. I was getting paid to judge swimsuit pageants across the country. I was getting paid to raise money for veteran nonprofits all across the country. And I screwed it up because I was trying to feel whole. 
I was trying to take and patch something that I couldn't patch. And I definitely couldn't do that when I was drunk. I definitely couldn't do that when I was loaded up on 33 different types of medications. So my life became unmanageable again. I decided to write a goodbye letter to my kids. I had a plan. I thought about it for about seven or eight days. I knew my feelings of wanting to kill myself just wouldn't go away. They were always there. To me, it's always been an option. Always. Since I can remember, it's always been an option. So I came up with the plan. I was going to drive a truck into a tree, make it look like I was driving from one point to the other on a job for as an accident. It was rainy. It was perfect. I had this tree planned out. And I wrote that goodbye letter and had it in my pocket six days prior. And one day, I just finally had it. At a month or two prior, my fiance had left me because I was unfaithful. I continued to lie, manipulate, cheat, do whatever I had to do to keep myself happy. So I went through with it. I got the truck up to 70 miles an hour and took the tr truck into the tree and you know, had a white knuckle on that steering wheel. And when I opened my eyes, not a scratch. The whole front end of the truck was caved in, the whole back end because I had a trailer on it. It's like an accordion. And I was pissed. I couldn't even kill myself. Police officer showed up. I was intoxicated. I was arrested for a DUI. They found out I had tried to kill myself. Uh, they put me in a little holding tank with, I mean, it looked like a moving blanket you wrap yourself into uh, in the cell. So the next day I reached out to the VA. The VA took me into their detox facility. I was there for 14 days. I'm like, great, I got sober. This is amazing. I've changed my life forever. And two days later, I was drinking again. And life spiraled out of control very, very quickly, much faster than the previous. So I had a buddy, again, Tony Meredith, the guy that saved me in Iraq. He came down. We went to a NASCAR race, and I got what we call white girl wasted. <laughs> and um, I was out of control. I was not me. And we were leaving, and I decided to urinate on a state trooper's police car <laughs> while he was standing there. And thank God for Tony. Tony had the conversation, told him exactly what was going through. You know, I got a tongue lashing and I took it, uh, but he didn't do anything. So word got out to another friend named Melissa Fitzgerald. If you don't know Melissa, she runs, uh, well, works at Justice for Vets, and uh, she was an actress on the West Wing. I became friends with her through another side project that I'd worked on. And she says, I think I got somebody that can help you. Are you ready? I said, I'll take all the help I can get. So I get this phone call from an angel. His name was West Huddleston. And I don't remember verbatim because I was still a little foggy. But uh, basically, he said, are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? I said, sir, yes, sir, I am. He said, good, pack your shit. I'll pick you up. You're going to rehab. So he did. He flew down, picked me up, didn't know the guy, tried to hug me. I wanted to punch him. Um, true story. <laughs> you like that. But I didn't know him. He was a complete stranger who was in a different state, who cared enough to stop what he was doing, to interject my life, to say, I will stand for you when you won't. That changed my life forever. I went on the Cirque Lodge in Sundance, Utah, and spent 47 days there working on myself. <clears throat> Finally, at some point, I was able to look in the mirror and recognize there was a human being behind it. Not a monster, not a loser, not a terrible father, not a terrible human being. I did those things, and I will own them every day for the rest of my lives. And I will feel the emotional pain that I have created for others. But today, I can own that. That's what it took. I had to peel back all these layers to understand empathy, respect, dignity, all these things that I learned as a young boy, all these things I learned in the military. But trauma will remove everything you learned if we don't take care of it. The thing I learned from it 
is expert companionship or whatever you want to call it. All the people that touched my lives throughout my life, Tony Meredith, Wes Huddleston, Melissa Fitzgerald, Mark Tietchan, if it weren't for those people, I wouldn't be here today. And I say that with confidence. It didn't stop there. Wes took me to rehab. I got out. I still had pending charges. Came back. I spoke at some event uh, for NADCP. And there was a guy in the crowd that had heard what had happened. He was standing up a veterans treatment court in North Carolina, the first one. And he said, hey, it's in Harnett County, which is like UP to you guys. <laughs> Way out there. I was in Charlotte. And uh, it was probably two and a half two hours and 45 minute drive each way. But he got me into this veterans treatment court. I had no idea, no concept other than, you know, uh, what Justice for Vets was doing. I never thought I'd be a part of that. So he invited me, I did, and uh, it was a little over a year I was in that process of just really owning my stuff. Veterans treatment court taught me how to be a man. Right? It took, taught me that ownership. Even still, I'd been doing that work of getting myself clean and sober. It was owning what I'd done. It was owning what I can be. I'd gotten a lot of great, easy, good treatment and kind of like, oh, you're, you did this, that's okay, we'll let that pass go, collect your 200 bucks. Uh, I was let off, not in Veterans Stream Accord. That judge held me to the same standard as he did everybody else, and it whipped my butt in shape. It's exactly what I needed at the time to project me to where I am now. So I asked you guys, if not you, then who? If you don't do it, who's going to? If you just look to the other person and say, well, I guess it's your turn, I would have missed my chance. If it wasn't for West, then who would have done that? The compassion, empathy, the love for your brother or sister is what we have to remind ourselves. In this room, we are reminded by that. I love and honor every one of you and are so appreciative that you guys stand up for what you say. Your actions speak louder than words. $20 helping somebody get a bus pass keeping them sober, giving them the opportunity to get their lives back. That's all every one of us need. And we're not far away. Every one of us are one life accident or one life problem from being where I was or being where they are. So every one of you, thank you. Thank you for your commitment, your hard work, dedication to the human being, and thank you for allowing me to be here today. sharing your story with us, your courage, your braveness. Thank you for your service. We're so grateful that you're here present with us and that we know that journey was tough, but you've enriched all of our lives. And, and it, it, I've, we've talked before about the power of one, just one person, as you heard Tommy say. And Wes, I, we, we've heard from you before, and you stood right here sharing your story, but I think we all just, I just want to acknowledge you. Could you just stand and let us show you our love, really? Please stand, Wes. Please. Thank you so much. Thank you, Wes. At this time, I would like to bring forward um, our graduates from 54B District Court, Christine and Trina. Good morning. Thank you all for allowing me to be here. I'm Christine. Um, and uh, let me tell you a little bit about my process of being um, a part of the 40 uh, District Court. Uh, 
a drug court program. Um, I had the honor of being the first member of um, our drug court program, and I take ownership of that program, as you can see, because I call it ours. Um, but um, I'm here today because of that program, um, and it would not, I would not be, uh, I just, it saved my life. So I'm excited and nervous <laughs> to be here to tell you about it. Um, but, uh, I was a college graduate and an active part of my family and working professional in my community. Um, and as a part of my career, I had trained to recognize drug-seeking behavior in patients that I helped to care for. I even educated them on the risks of opioid dependency uh, to surgical patients as part of their pre-op care. This is why it was so surprising that I didn't notice it happening to me until it was, our, it was too late. Too late, in hindsight, I asked myself, too late for what? Too late to risk my marriage, to lose my job, bargain my freedom, too late to sacrifice my own voice in exchange for one more dose of not feeling the loss. Because in the end, it would be all those things and much more. In November 2016, when I found myself in Amy Eisler's office, I was recovering from my 10th leg surgery in a year, <clears throat> in a year's time, and countless others in the years before that. I'd been diagnosed with lupus and deforming arthritis and survived giving the eulogy at my twin sister's funeral. I didn't notice when it started that I, that I was over medicating the physical pain or even um, the drug treating the physical pain had become a drug for emotional pain. I started to notice that I needed the medication with such urgency that it started my day without even assessing my physical condition, that I would anticipate a hard conversation with my, with my mother, <clears throat> and I would take just one more dose. Eventually, I knew my wife didn't recognize me anymore, but she was afraid to ask me why. She just knew that somewhere inside that person she was looking at was her wife, and she held on to that. Because of her bravery, to hold on to that and her willingness to fill in the blanks to Miss Eisler's questions when I couldn't answer them myself. I think I lost my voice two years before at the end of that eulogy, right around the time when I should have started to grieve. Turns out I needed to learn that too. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm running out of hands. <laughs> Just like that, I became the first member of the 54B District Court Drug Court Program. I think on a scale, you have a willing participant an un unwilling participant, and then there was me. I was so willing to trust the process and the people involved because it was clear to me that I had no other choice. Everything I had, including my own breath, depended on it. I mean, could not imagine surviving myself, but these people could, these strangers, but I didn't know. Looked at me and had faith that I would succeed. The treatment team involved in our program was able to look at my situation as a whole <clears throat> and work with a specific goal in mind. We had a deadline. Eight months from my beginning program, I would be going back to surgery, and this one would be my hardest recovery yet. I would have to change my relationship with my drug of choice and with my dealers. That was my first assignment, to <clears throat> tell all my doctors about my addiction and now my recovery. In the 18 months I spent in drug court, I underwent four more surgeries, the last of which took my leg. I've been successful at maintaining my recovery because of the structured environment of our program that built me an arsenal of which to defend myself against because recovery is work each and every day. The counseling services that guided me through the grieving process in the one-on-one -on -one relationship with probation officer Amy Eisler helped me find my voice. And I think they wish I'd shut up now. <laughs> um, but above all else, it has given me a family, an incredible close support system that surrounds my life today and allows me to succeed in my recovery, my marriage, and my future. 
one of the most important relationships that have come from my recovery is becoming a sponsor. I've, I've sponsored three drug court member, um, members now. Um, and about a year ago, I had a chance to sponsor a young woman who joined 54B District Court Drug Court Program, and she continues <laughs> to surprise me with her strength and motivation. It is her influence that convinced me to go back to grad school in the spring to pursue a career in addiction service counseling. I'm honored to introduce my fellow graduate and sponsee, Trina Day. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm a little nervous, I'll admit, but um, first I just want to say thank you for everyone's commitment in this room um, to us. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak here. I'm very grateful to be here. Um, and with that, I'll begin. Um, I'm going to go back here so I can flip this off. Okay. Before addiction ruled my life, I was a pretty normal girl. I grew up in a household with two parents, regularly attended church, and went to public school in Williamston. When I was 14, my parents divorced, and my normal life changed. I began to act out. I ended up getting pregnant with my first child while I was in high school, but still managed to graduate. A year after graduation, I moved out on my own with my son and his father. I maintained a job and paid the bills, but was partying all the time, pretty much whenever I was not working. At the age of 27, me and my oldest son's father were no longer together, although he stayed very active in our son's life. I couldn't seem to be alone for too long, and so my relationship with a heroin addict began. When I met him, I had no clue he was addicted to heroin. Although I was no angel and loved to party, I had not been introduced to hard drugs yet. This new man in my life introduced me to heroin for the first time. When I saw how it made him feel, I begged him to give me some so I could experience the same euphoria I saw in his face whenever he did it. It was then that I became an IV heroin user. Looking at me today, most of you would not peg me to be an ex-IV drug user. And that's because I finally got sick and tired of what drugs took from me in my life. There are no words to describe the pain, shame, and loss you experience in active addiction. Sometimes people that have not been through addiction seem to think that we as addicts are selfish because we just don't care about responsibility or our family or our children. Or they think that we don't want to stop because it's so much fun. I am here to tell you that is the farthest from the truth. Being an addict is not fun. Waking up one day and realizing that the drug you tried makes you so sick when it is not in your system that you are willing to do unspeakable things to get it is not fun. Not being able to stop to the point where all you want to do is die is not fun. Losing your children because you are so far gone that coming back seems literally impossible is not fun. Feeling like you are the worst human being on the planet every minute of every day is not fun. Hurting the people that love you the most on a daily basis is not fun. This drug took a hold of me instantly and stopped being fun the minute I took it. I lost my children, I lost my family and friends, but most importantly, I lost myself. I lost everything to the disease of addiction. At the age of 29, two years into my heroin and now cocaine addiction, I was driving erratically and got pulled over. At this time in my life, I looked like the walking dead. When the officer came to my window, I did not have my driver's license, so he detained me, and as he did so, he noticed something poking out of my shirt. He then radioed for a female officer to search me. I was so scared and so very alone. The female officer found heroin, crack cocaine, Adderall, and a needle on my person. This was the first time I had ever been arrested in my life. I was jailed in downtown Lansing overnight. The next day, I managed to get someone to bail me out. My charges were three felony counts of drug possession. The first thing I did when I got out was go use. I had never been so scared in my life, and although I did not have much of a life, it was all crumbling around me. My mother was attending FAN, Family Against Narcotics, during my addiction for support. At one of the meetings, she was reaching out about my current situation and got introduced to Phil Pavona. Phil Pavona got in contact with me and Amy Eisler, trying to see if I would be a good candidate for the 54B District Court Drug Court Program. And that is how I ended up in that treatment court. 
54B Drug Court is to this day my saving grace. This program is not your run-of-the-mill court program. My experience in 54B is something that will always stick with me. Trust me when I say at first I was not at all happy or grateful to be in such an amazing program that offered me a second chance at life. In the beginning I was violating left and right and still couldn't seem to get my bearings. The reason I say it is not your run-of-the-mill court program is because they took a personal look into me as an individual and saw all the things that I could be buried underneath this thing called addiction. They cared enough for me when I couldn't to not give up. They saw a mother, a daughter, a sister, and a person hurting. They did not ever look at me as just another probationer that they couldn't wait to rid themselves of. They saw me, the me that my mom said I was, the me that all the people I love still saw. There are so many things that drug court did for me that I don't even have the time to express in this short speech, but I will try to give you the best picture I can. Drug court, for one, gave me Christine, one of the most beautiful souls I have ever met. She became my sponsor, my friend, my confidant. She is always, always there to be a listening ear, full of compassion and ready to hear me and help guide me in life and recovery with no judgment. The drug court gave me Amy Eisler, and as I write this, I can barely hold back the tears of joy for the fact that I have her in my life. She, she is the reason I believed in myself. Although she was my PO, she wasn't just that. She was someone that had never faced addiction in her life, but still had the heart and passion to help people that did face addiction. She is one of the wisest and most beautiful people I know. We still talk on a weekly basis, and I share all my victories and defeats with her to this day. Drug court gave me Judge Larkin, such an amazing human being. She wasn't just my judge. She was a person who looked at me and said, we will figure out how to help you get back to you. Drug court gave me back my family and my oldest son, who is the most handsome, amazing young man that I know. My son has persevered and has the biggest heart of anyone I know. My mom couldn't be more proud, and I am so blessed that the best mom in the world stood by me through it all. She is my rock, and I hope to be half the woman she is one day. My stepdad has been the man in my life to stand by me in the good and bad times. And drug court made it possible for us to have a relationship again. I have been in the best relationship I have ever been in, been in with a man coming up on two years. Drug court gave me that because they helped me see that I was worth having a good man love me. Drug court is not just some program. Drug court is the program. After I graduated drug court, I got certified as a peer recovery coach and I'm now working for Mid-Michigan Recovery Services, which is also a program that I went through and graduated. Drug Court didn't just give me my life back. Drug Court helped me see my worth and how important it is to share that worth with the world and give back to the same community that tirelessly gave to me. The success of Drug Court speaks for itself. Five of their graduates are currently working the, in the addiction recovery field, and the most special thing about Drug Court is that they don't give up. Getting clean and having the strength to build your life up from scratch takes time, effort, and a team of people that sees addicts as people, not as just another junkie. I am living proof of what drug court can and continues to do in people's lives that everyone else gave up on. As a peer recovery coach for MMRS, I now get to sit on the pre-court treatment team meeting, sitting beside the, the judge that I once had to stand before, next to the PO that I once had to answer to, and next to the therapist that once helped me navigate my recovery. I am now seen as a colleague and someone who can inspire change. Talk about coming full circle. My name is Trina Day, and I am two years clean, and I'm damn proud to say that I am an addict in recovery. A lot of times we talk about statistics and we talk about numbers and we talk about the number of people that have graduated and how successful the court is. But when you hear testimonials like we just did from Christine and Trina with words like saving grace, no judgment, 
the court took a personal look at the individual, an arsenal of incredible support, cared for me when I couldn't. We will get you back to being you. The, the court helps me see my worth. I mean, you, it's so powerful. It's so powerful what you do. Um, thank you for opening your hearts, sharing your stories. You just, we're, we're proud of you. We're, we're so hopeful. Um, thank you to your family and friends for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can we give them another round of applause? This is absolutely incredible. incredible. I wouldn't miss this breakfast for nothing. So <laughs> um, that concludes my part. Uh, I just want to say thank you for being here. Thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you for supporting this incredible work of art. Thank you for what you do and making it your life's mission to serve when we know you could be doing other things. But being in the county court system and leading these courts is just an incredible legacy. So my continued heartfelt thank you for you. <laughs> Truly. I get to tell you that the gifts on your table are from the foundation, so please take those as our thank you to you. They're incredible pens. I'm going to turn it back over to John now to close out our program. Have a great day. All right, we've uh, certainly kept you far too long, so thank you for staying with us. Thank you for your powerful stories, all three of you. Um, One last opportunity for me to ask you to consider donating to the foundation. You do have a commitment form. As you can see, our role, our mission is to assist these people in order to turn their lives around, in order for them to have a second chance. So whatever you can do, we thank you now. Uh, I do want to thank you all for coming. We want to thank our judges, of course. Um, members of our treatment court staffs, they're here with us. You've heard about their powerful stories as well, even though they're always in the background. They're the ones doing the real hard work. Um, we'd like to thank Sherry Jones. She's the queen of our breakfast. She is every year. And one more time, thank you to Staff Sergeant Tommy Riemann and to our two speakers. and Christine and Trina for sharing your very powerful stories. All right, there's no more words on my pages. You are free to go.